cancer. Max. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. That was great timing. Um, and so yeah, today I'm going to tell you about a new statistical test we've developed for uh, mutually exclusive mutations in cancer. And so I want to just jump in with uh, some background on cancer. Um, it's probably a review for most people. So cancer is a disease caused by somatic mutations that accumulate over time. I'm shown in this, this lineage here. Um, and so a key subset of the mutations are so-called driver mutations. So um, responsible for leading to increased cell growth and rapid accumulation of mutations. And so in a typical tumor, um, drivers are rare. You have maybe one to 10 driver mutations and tens to thousands of uh, so-called passenger mutations that have no consequence for cancer. And so it's an important uh, biological problem, um, both for cancer research and therapy, to distinguish the drivers from the passengers. And so one thing we know about the driver mutations is they tend to target pathways. So uh, everybody probably knows their pathways, but for today's talk, it's just a group of genes that interact to perform some function. Um, and so the mutations, the driver mutations, the pathways, uh, give cancer cells uh, required functions. And so in general, uh, cancers require driver mutations to multiple pathways. Um, so for example, you might have a, a cancer where it has uh, you know, one of the, a driver mutation in a cell growth pathway, an invasion pathway, and a DNA damage repair pathway. And because each of these pathways consists of multiple genes, each pathway can be perturbed in multiple ways. And this leads to the observation that different combinations of mutations cause cancer in different patients. And so this complicates the discovery or the identification of drivers from passengers. Um, and so there are many different ways people have tried to distinguish the drivers from passengers. We're going to focus on one today, um, which is looking for mutually exclusive combinations of mutations. And so uh, what are mutually exclusive mutations and why are we interested in them? Um, well, I'm going to illustrate it with an example from Thomas et al. Uh, and it was kind of motivated very well this morning. So they looked at mutations in the RTK RAS signaling pathway. Uh, so here I'm showing this mutation matrix where we have genes or loci as rows, patients as columns, and each of these marks, the red or black marks, are indicating a mutation in a particular gene and sample or patient. And you can see that relatively few patients have more than one mutation since relatively few columns have more than one mark. So you can say that the mutations in this pathway are, are mutually exclusive across these patients. Um, and in fact, it's the observation that you have approximately one driver mutation per pathway per patient. So there's kind of two explanations for this. The first is just the fact that there are relatively few driver mutations that have to be distributed across multiple, uh, multiple pathways to give the cancer cell multiple different functions. Um, there's also a, 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 a selection argument, which is that there's no additional fitness advantage for multiple driver mutations in the same pathway. And so over the past five years, there have been many different methods introduced for identifying uh, mutually exclusive mutations. And so that's going to be the focus of, of today's talk. And so in particular, I'm going to describe uh, WEXT, our new weighted exclusivity test for mutations in cancer. Um, and I'm going to describe how, even though it's a general test, we can use it to efficiently approximate two commonly used statistical tests for mutual exclusivity, uh, and also show how it improves upon earlier methods of analyzing tumors with high and highly variable mutation rates. And this is uh, slated to appear in, in ECCB later this year. And so first, I want to start with kind of framing the problem. Um, and so if we, have a, if we observe a binary mutation matrix A, where we have genes as rows and patients as columns, just like I showed you a moment ago, what we're really looking for is a row submatrix such as M here, uh, which is a, a set of K genes where they have uh, fulfilling two properties. So the first is high coverage. We want most patients to have at least one mutation, which you can see is kind of filled here, and approximate exclusivity. Uh, few patients have more than one mutation shown in this kind of orange here. And so in, uh, in 2012, um, Van Dien et al. introduced the Dendrix algorithm uh, that used a combinatorial score for a row submatrix uh, of genes, um, W. And it was actually the coverage minus the overlap. So it's kind of the blue minus the orange in, in this plot here. Um, and it's very fast to compute. And they showed it kind of uncovered some interesting results on real data. Um, but later, people noticed kind of a, a drawback, which is that it had difficulty sometimes weighing the coverage versus the overlap. And so we actually saw that ourselves. We applied Dendrix um, to TCGA, or the Cancer Genome Atlas endometrial cancer. So we looked at this data set of 248 endometrial carcinomas from TCGA uh, in 2014. And so I'm showing you the top five triples identified by Dendrix in that data set, along with their weights. So here are the genes. And, uh, and I'm showing you the mutation matrix for the top triple right here. And you can see that you know, the first two genes have largely exclusive mutations, but you're actually adding this third gene 
um, which is actually contributing just about the same amount of coverage and overlap and kind of looks like it's you know, making the mutual exclusivity signal a lot less clean. Um, and this is exactly that problem I'm talking about with uh, you're not actually taking into account the number of mutations in the gene. And so this prompted uh, researchers to develop um, statistical scores for mutual exclusivity. Um, and so in particular, uh, computing the surprise of the mutual exclusivity conditioned on each gene's mutation frequency. And so if you had a pair of genes, um, how might you compute this? Well, you could cross-classify patients into a two-by-two -two contingency table, counting the number uh, not mutated in either gene, mutated in one gene, mutated in the other gene only, or mutated in both. And then you could use a test statistic T, the number of patients with exactly one mutation, so the sum of these blue cells. Um, and then you could use Fisher's exact test, one-sided Fisher's exact test for independence to compute the significance of this exclusivity. And so we call this the row exclusivity test because you're conditioning on the number of mutations per gene, which is just the row sums of our binary mutation matrix here. And so last year, uh, we introduced a generalized test for sets of any size K, which we can compute with our, with our common algorithm. And so then, uh, you know, after using Dendrix on the endometrial data set, we decided to use Comet um, now that we have the statistical score. And so here are the top five triples on that same data set. Uh, and you can see they actually look very similar, both in terms of the, the triples themselves, and also if you look at the mutation matrix, you kind of see the same phenomenon where you have you know, a pair of largely exclusive genes, but then you also have this gene that doesn't seem to be contributing very much. And so at first we were kind of confused about this, but we realized there's an explanation if you, if you look more into uh, the particular cancer type we're analyzing. And so in fact, the mutation rate per endometrial patient can vary a lot. And so in fact, TCGA split the 248 endometrial carcinomas into four different groups, uh, reproducing a figure from their paper here, um, and where two of the groups are uh, characterized as hypermutators because they have uh, many more somatic mutations per megabase. And so in fact, if you go in and look at our mutation matrix again and color uh, the samples, the mutations, by whether they're in hypermutators a lot, you can see that uh, you know, almost all of the co-occurring mutations are, are in these hypermutator samples. And this led us to know something else, which is that uh, in each of these sets, we have a, a gene that's uh, a relatively long gene. So it encodes a protein longer than 11,000 amino acids. So it's one of the longest uh, genes in the genome. And so these long genes are just more likely to be mutated by chance. And that's especially true in these hypermutators. And so the patient mutation rate is actually changing our expected amount of exclusivity. And so we need to take that into account. And this is particularly vital because the mutation rate per tumor um, can, can vary a lot. And so it can actually vary over uh, several orders of magnitude. So I'm showing this figure from Lawrence et al. Uh, from 2013, where they're looking at the, the mutation rate um, across different cancer types. Uh, and, and you can see there's kind of wide variability. Even within some of the, an individual cancer type, you'll have you know, very large variability. Um, and there's multiple causes for this, from environmental uh, to you know, faulty DNA damage repair or microsatellite instability. Um, and this is not taken into account at all with that row exclusivity test computed by Comet that I described earlier. Uh, and so since it changes the expected amount of ex exclusivity, we really need to take into account. And so, um, so we need some sort of statistical score uh, that takes into account the, the mutation rate per patient or tumor. And so uh, one way you can do this is you can actually uh, fix the number of mutations per patient or condition on the number of mutations per patient in your statistical test. And so in addition to conditioning on the number of mutations per gene, you also look at the number of mutations per patient. And how would you do this? Well, um, you could compute a p-value by generating all permutations of A, so our entire mutation matrix, where we're fixing both the row and column sums. And then if we have our fixed uh, set M, we can compute the, the exclusivity of M in each of these permutations. And this would give us a distribution of exclusivity, which we can use to compute the p-value. And so we call this the row-column exclusivity test. Uh, again, you know, obviously named because it's coming from conditioning on the number of mutations per gene and per patient, which is the row and column sums of A. And so similar tests such as this have been used in mutual exclusivity studies before, um, but it's very computationally expensive to compute p-values because you have to look at this entire mutation matrix with you know, thousands of genes by hundreds of patients. And so previously people have used uh, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 permutations to approximate this p-value. Um, and so we went and, and did that on this endometrial data set. Uh, we go and compute the row column exclusivity test uh, using 10,000 permutations. Um, and what we found is we have 4,070 triples that have, that are basically indistinguishable by this test. 
um, because they have a p-value less than 10 to the minus fourth. And so we're not able to, to compute these small p-values accurately. And this kind of raises the, the current challenges for, for computing row, row column exclusivity is that you cannot compute the small p-values accurately just because it's so computationally uh, expensive. And so to address this challenge, uh, we developed a new weighted exact test for mutual exclusivity that uses per gene, per patient mutation probabilities. Uh, and then we're able to compute these p-values exactly, which is computationally intensive, but we also derived a saddle point approximation uh, that's fast enough to be able to use on kind of genome scale data sets. And our test actually generalizes the row exclusivity test, which I'll describe in a moment, and we show how we can use it to quickly and accurately approximate the row column exclusivity test. And so I wanna delve a little bit into the details of the model. So just like before, we're observing this mutation matrix A, uh, but now we're also given mutation probabilities or mutation weights W. And so our model is we're gonna treat every mutation as an independent Bernoulli trial uh, with the probability of gene I being mutated in patient J is given by the corresponding entry in W. And so given that, we have our weighted row exclusivity test. So for a set M of K genes, we're gonna compute the probability of observing at least as many uh, exclusive mutations in M given the number of mutations uh, in each of the genes. So again, we're fixing, you know, conditioning on the row sums and also given this mutation probability matrix W. And so we can compute this exactly or, or in practice with a saddle point approximation. And there's one other thing I want you to notice, which is that, um, that this is generalizing the row exclusivity test uh, because that's a special case where for a given gene, all of the weights are the same. So they're kind of uniform weights. So one of these rows is all, all the same value. And so looking at this model, uh, probably the first thing you're wondering is, that's great, but how do we get these mutation probabilities? Um, and so one way we can do this is we can actually estimate these weights W uh, in order to approximate the row column exclusivity test. And so what we can do is we can generate N permutations of A, again, this, this mutation matrix A, um, fixing both the row and column sums of A. And then we can assign weights to, to entry WIJ as just the fraction of permutations where gene I is mutated in, in patient J. And so on the endometrial cancers, you get a matrix like this where you can see there's, you know, some genes are very unlikely to be mutated in, in some patients and, and, you know, in others, um, they're actually quite likely to be mutated. And so uh, I'm gonna describe some of the results we have of, with, with our weighted exclusivity test, our WEXT. Um, and so in the, in the paper, we show how we can quickly and accurately compute uh, this row exclusivity p-value using our saddle point approximation. Since, since our uh, weighted row exclusivity test is a generalization of it, I'm not gonna go into that today. Uh, instead, I'm gonna describe how we can use it to approximate this row column exclusivity test that I described earlier. Uh, and then we also identify exclusive mutations in hundreds of tumors from TCGA from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, we look at two different cancer types that have high and highly variable mutation rates. And we also looked at uh, thyroid cancer where you have relatively few mutations per patient as kind of a control where we actually see that the row column and row exclusivity tests kind of return the same thing. So conditioning on the patient frequencies doesn't really change the results. And so for today, I'm just gonna focus on, these, on the endometrial cancers. And so first, uh, I wanna describe how, uh, or show you how WEX can approximate this row column exclusivity test. And so we estimated the weights uh, WRC with 1,000 permutations to compute these p-values. And then we computed the row column exclusivity with a million permutations. And so I'm, I'm showing you a scatter plot where we have the, uh, the weighted row exclusivity p-values here and, and the row column exclusivity p-value here. And you can see that you know, they're strongly correlated. So we have this correlation coefficient. And they only start to kind of differ from one another once you go below precision um, from the permutation test since we can only get p-values of 10 to the minus sixth. And you can also see that you know, the, the weighted row exclusivity test um, finds or computes much smaller p-values, so things that you could, in practice, basically never compute uh, with this permutation test. Um, and in addition, so WEX is orders of magnitude faster, including the time to generate these weights. Uh, it only takes around 30 minutes to compute all of the p-values for all the triples in this data set, um, while it takes much longer than a day for the row column exclusivity. And so this is all good, but the, the really good part is that it makes a difference on real data. Um, so here I'm showing you the uh, top five triples from the endometrial data set uh, using WEXT. And so there's a couple of things I want you to notice. The first is, you know, I was describing these long genes before. Um, here we only have one of these long genes, uh, which is good. Uh, in addition, if you go and look at the, the mutation matrix itself of the top triple, uh, you can see that it's kind of much cleaner, much more exclusivity. 
And each of these sets are actually not mutated in that many hypermutators. It's around 50% to 60%. So we're not kind of biased towards the hypermutators like the row exclusivity test, um, but we're not ignoring them either. And in fact, six of the seven predictions in these top five are, are known cancer genes. And this, you know, just to remind you, compared to the row exclusivity test computed by Comet, it's quite different where only two of the seven were known cancer genes and you had many of these long genes mutated in most of the hypermutators. Um, so, you know, in, in summary, in conclusion, uh, I presented this new weighted test for mutually exclusive mutations and, and showed how we can use it to approximate or, or compute uh, commonly used uh, statistical tests for exclusivity. I've showed you some analysis on cancer types with high and highly variable mutation rates. Uh, and just to briefly mention some future directions we're thinking about, one is uh, doing some pan-cancer analysis, analyzing multiple cancer types simultaneously. And we're also thinking about, since this is a general test, different sort of weighting schemes. And so I want to acknowledge my co-authors, in particular uh, my PhD advisor, Ben Raphael, and Matt Reyna. Um, also our funding and data, particularly from Brown, NIH, NSF, and the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, we have a preprint. I was trying to get it out for today, but it'll come out tomorrow. You can look on our website tomorrow and we'll have it. And uh, the software is available on GitHub. Thank you. Thank you, Max, for a very nice talk. Uh, we have time to take some questions.